Welcome back. This is the ETF Market Insights webinar. I'm Danielle Nuzzle with BMO Exchange Traded Funds. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our last session of 2021. It's been a great year. We're so happy to have you all join us week after week. Today, we're going to unpack what happened in 2021. Where did the markets go? Where did the flows go in ETFs? Um, and we have a few experts to guide us through that conversation today. But before we get going, as always, this is our disclaimer slide. So as a brief reminder, we're not providing any advice today. We're not providing you with any recommendations. Today's conversation is purely educational focused. And of course, with that extra focus on exchange traded funds. Our panel of experts today, we have John Chevro from Financial Independence Hub. He's also a blogger on um, Money Sense, and we have Mark Rays from BMO ETFs as well. So a warm welcome to our guests. Our tool and resource we'd like to highlight today, this comes straight from John. John, I'd love it if you could walk us through this uh, fabulous resource for investors to check out. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Well, Finnependence Hub has been going for um, seven years, and it's uh, free. All you need to do is pop in your email, and you'll get a daily uh, email blast. Uh, there's new content uh, blogs about five times, well, five times a day, five times a week, 52 weeks a year, and uh, you may even see some BMO content from time to time. Uh, I think uh, Kevin Prince has done a couple of nice pieces for it. Um, the, the bottom left corner, you can see Independence Day, which is a book, a financial novel that I wrote in Canada several, some years ago. What you see here is a new cover of the second U.S. edition, which you can get at Best Books in media in, the, in New York City. So that's it for uh, Independence Hub. Over to you. Thanks, John. This is a really great resource. Lots of great articles on there. If you're looking for some extra reading over the holidays, definitely check it out. So 2021 was another really big year for ETFs here in Canada. If you remember in 2020, um, we broke some records with flows. Well, 2021 looks like we'll be breaking uh, that record once again. So we, the first half of the year, that's the dark blue bar you're looking at on the screen. Flows beat last year's first half of the year and we've already exceeded uh, flows in 2020. And hey, the year's not even over yet. We still have a few weeks to go. These numbers are as of uh, November 30th. The Canadian ETF industry, it's now over $336 billion. And I know, uh, you know, if you remember back to when this all started and ETF started listing over a decade ago, that number was so small. So wow, tremendous growth in the ETF industry here in Canada. And over a thousand ETFs are trading on the exchange, which means investors have a lot to choose from, but also a lot to sort out when they're trying to pick the right building blocks for their portfolios. Now, in terms of uh, Canadian ETF providers, the big three really dominate the market. So that's Vanguard, iShares, and Bank of Montreal uh, make up about 70% of that $336 billion. And then of course, a few other small players there as well. Now, new products. Uh, uh, this year. Before you get into that, I was just pointing out one thing. I think there's plenty of growth left because last I checked, the mutual fund industry is still seven times as big as ETF. So you, you really ain't seen nothing yet. I, I, I'm surprised ETFs haven't already caught up to mutual funds. So maybe we'll still see that in the next year or two. Absolutely. Great, great point there, John. And you know, ETFs are just growing tremendously. Of course, the mutual fund business has been around much longer. It's a lot of legacy uh, dollars in there, but hey, 192 new ETFs launched, launched in the last 12 months. Mark, I know you spend a lot of time uh, bringing new ETFs to market. And of course you have a pulse on all the new ETFs that we're seeing get, getting listed. What are your thoughts on uh, what we've seen get listed? so far in 2021. Sure. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, everyone, for listening in once again. Appreciate your time. Um, yeah, so if we look at new listings, I think the dominant uh, story this year has been the introduction of you know, Bitcoin ETFs here in, in Canada, uh, certainly Canada being the first place to offer crypto uh, ETFs anywhere in the world. So that's a pretty exciting story for Canada. 
so I think we're seeing a lot of interest in those ET ETFs, not just domestically, but probably from around the world. Uh, so that's a big story, you know, just continuing to add to that that ETF story of providing access to, to things that are a bit harder to invest in. So that's just a continuation of, you know, what's occurred in the past with fixed income, with, with gold and commodities, uh, with international products. You know, ETFs really provide a convenient wrapper for investors uh, to get access to what they're looking to invest in. So that, that's been a big story. Uh, for sure as well, ESG or responsible investing, uh, some environmental, social governance type products, uh, those have definitely come to the forefront, particularly in terms of launches. Um, I think assets are, are picking up, but more than anything, we're seeing a lot of new products in that space. Uh, so that's great to see. That's really allowing investors to, to align their values with their portfolios. So you may have a broad ESG slant to your portfolio. You may have something that's more climate aware. Uh, you may be using it as satellites to other positions that you have. Lots of different ways you can use ESG, uh, but certainly that's been, been a big area of launches um, this year. And then thematic would be the last that I'd mention. I'd, I'd kind of couple that with finding global growth. I think everyone wants to see their portfolios working hard for them. Uh, we're certainly all aware of the strong returns in markets since March of 2020. So thematics, things that find innovation in the marketplace. Clean energy is another area we've seen a number of launches in. Uh, different precise themes uh, that one ETF ticker allows you to get at the theme without worrying about individual stock selection. So allows you to make that that trade that you're looking to make without having to necessarily do a deep dive on individual companies. So those are probably the biggest at this point. Uh, and as John said, lots of room for growth ahead. Thanks, Mark. And I just think it was so interesting looking at the screen right now is the ETFs listed here are all less than 12 months listed on the exchange and the flows that have gone into them in less than 12 months. And of course, all of them our, our crypto assets, except one, we have ESGY, BMO's MSCI USA ESG Leaders ETF uh, has gathered some significant assets. So showing that that trend uh, moving money into ESG products uh, is, is really strong. Now, where did the rest of the flows go this year? So of course our numbers aren't to the end of December. We have um, our numbers year to date as of November 30th. And we're seeing some of these these trends or these big themes really playing out when we're looking at where money is going. So of course, crypto assets like we saw in the last slide, and maybe I'll mention a lot of that money is also coming up from the US because of how Mark mentioned, these uh, types of products aren't listed in the US, they're only allowed right now in Canada. So we're seeing a lot of US dollars come up to Canada in those. Of course, broad index equities uh, tend to always be a favorite year over year and aggregate bonds as well, ESG. And then another big story is those asset allocation ETFs. We're seeing investors really start to figure these out as great single ticket options for uh, core portfolio positions. So uh, very interesting to see where, where the money is flowing this year. Now, what's been happening in the market? So. Mark, we're seeing another big bull run after the pandemic dip in 2020. Uh, what are your thoughts here on where how equities are kind of running and do they have do they have stamina to keep going in 2022? Sure, thanks Danielle. Yeah, we're seeing great returns this year. Uh, what's probably notably different, Canada keeping up um, with the U.S. this year. I'd say particularly on the back of the um, the vaccine trade. So ever since you know essentially November of 2020, Canada's really been keeping pace. Uh, energy has been a big part of the story here in Canada, but as well the the banks. And then if you you know you look at the U.S., still strong growth uh, across the board. Um, and we'll get to it in a sec. But the one thing that does seem to be cropping up more, of course, is that inflation conversation. Uh, so for companies that are highly uh, growth companies that they're you know looking at cash flows that are out in the future, 
you know, higher inflation does impact cash flow modeling. Uh, so there's more of an impact on those high growth companies. So you're seeing that a little bit of noise in the marketplace. But overall, really strong environment for equities. Uh, of course, we've seen earnings rebound across the board. We're now seeing companies that you know couldn't raise dividends, like Canadian banks, uh, starting to step into that space are real positive for investors. Um, and if if you look at the markets, you know the the central banks are still accommodative, although obviously getting more hawkish. Uh, so subject to whatever might go on with COVID in in the next year, uh, I think markets are in a pretty good place. You know, that contrasts quite a bit to fixed income. So you'll notice aggregate bonds on your slide there is a negative. And here's the components of the bond market also negative across the board. So you've really got two things going on there. One is absolutely uh, that inflation has, has come in pretty hot. I think the last reading, you know, in Canada, four and a half, five percent. Uh, so that's certainly impacting fixed income but as well the risk of rising rates across the board as uh, on the short end, uh, certainly central banks are expected in 2022 to start tightening. So for fixed income, definitely a challenging environment, uh, but for equities, things are still looking very strong going forward uh, with the obvious caveats of, of COVID and any runaway inflation. Thanks, Danielle. Great, thanks, Mark. And maybe I'll just point out in, in this slide, I, I broke down all the different segments of the Canadian bond market to give uh, give our audience really a look or drill down at how those returns look. And you can see that pattern, the shorter end of the curve, uh, really more protected than that longer end. And of course, an ETF is available to tap into each of these segments of the market. So if investors are looking to dial back on duration, they have the tools to do that. Daniel, could I ask you, um, yeah. the, uh, on the inflation side, there's, there, that slide doesn't have anything on inflation bonds like tips or real return bond funds. Uh, I'm just curious whether that inflation that we've experienced was reflected yet in the returns of, of real return bond funds and tip funds. I know you have at least one short-term tips fund. You do. So that's actually a U.S. exposure because it's tips. So I just pulled I just pulled the Canadian exposures here, but we do have a real return bond as well, which is a Canadian exposure. Now speaking of duration, that is a longer duration um, ETF, and so you'll see that duration side of it adds the risk, even though the inflation side is protected. If I were to show you the returns on the screen, John, let's stick with you for a second here because I know you've been writing a lot about this topic i pulled up this article you just wrote a couple of weeks ago um you know what are your thoughts on this now that bonds are are we're not in a great environment for bonds we, we are in a good environment for equities what does this mean for investors in their portfolio construction what are your thoughts there yeah well i mean that's an interesting slide there i mean first of all i see the emerging markets has the, the higher expected return uh and uh it looks like uh uh, EFI as well. I mean, everything I've read lately is the U.S. Is, is richly valued. That slide a couple of slides ago where you showed the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, I was going to say that basically those big five, six FANG stocks uh, make up, what is it, uh, more than a quarter or, or, or of the uh, returns of the S&P 500. And uh, right now I'm seeing a lot of talk, even since the, since the interest rate uh, and the, the, since the Fed started to get a little hawkish this week, uh, that we're going to see a little bit of a rundown. In fact, I think we're seeing a, some tech stock sell off and growth stocks and people are starting to talk about value again. And some people in Templeton, I think, would argue that there's probably more value in Europe, Australia, Far East and, and possibly emerging market equities. Um, I don't think that the, I think it's. Any, any financial expert would not be surprised by that headline that stocks will outperform bonds in the next 10 years. Twas ever thus. The only question is to what extent to, does your asset allocation need to be uh, uh, rejigged? And you know, I, perhaps we'll look at the, the uh, asset allocation ETFs that BMO and, uh, and its competitors uh, provide. Uh, personally, I think you know something around the 60-40 the classic pension fund mix uh, would probably do it for the average investor. Great, thanks so much, John, for that. Now, I'm gonna move on to, I think, one of the biggest topics of the year that we've seen. There's a lot to talk about here. Inflation, we just saw those CPI numbers reported in Canada around 4.7%. 
And then in the US, the November number, 6.8%. Percent the market is this. That's what this chart is showing here. What what is the market pricing in looking forward? Because remember these reported CPI numbers are backward looking. The market's pricing in around three and a half um, expected inflation, three and a half percent over the next five years. Mark, what are your thoughts on inflation and what's going on? How investors should be looking at their portfolio, looking for that in, inflation hedge? Sure. Thanks, Danielle. And you know, there's a question of healthy inflation and then there's a question of runaway inflation. So obviously the risk in the market right now is we're now talking about runaway inflation because we're, we're seeing prints, as, you, as you've mentioned, uh, you know, well above the, the expected rate long term, which is really still targeting about 2%. But if we're running at 4, 5, 6%, uh, certainly that starts to become problematic. So again, that becomes more of an issue for um, Oh, Mark, I think we lost you. Just checking if you're still there. Looks like you might be on mute. Mark, I'll just give you a minute to, to sort that out, but you know, good good point there on runaway inflation and what the central banks are targeting, which is around that two two percent rate. Oh, Mark, I think we have you back. Oh, did I cut out for a sec there? Yeah, no problem. Okay, sorry, not sure how much of that you heard then. Um, I'll just maybe quickly repeat, but try to make it faster. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly on. Uh, Inflation, if you get runaway inflation, it's a problem for equities. Uh, reasonable inflation is is okay. Uh, certainly more inflation impacting growth stocks and, of course, bad for fixed income, which are based on, on fixed coupon amounts. So I think what you're seeing at this point uh, is a bit more of a rotation towards equity, maybe some more quality in the portfolios, um, but making sure then that you're not overexposed to, to fixed income. Uh, and the other I'd quickly mention is, of course, exposure to real assets, commodities, uh, properties, things of that nature that that hold up to to inflation uh, are great investments as well. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Great point there. This is something that, John, I know you've written uh, about a lot this year. Uh, you know, this great article about how is inflation going to impact people who are retired and might have that larger, um, you know, allocation to fixed income or might need that extra income. Uh, what are your thoughts on inflation hedging a portfolio in this kind of environment? Thanks, Danielle. Well, you, we mentioned a few already, the real return bonds and then TIPS is, is the U.S. equivalent of Canada's real return bonds. So, um, bond funds that uh, basically the more inflation goes up, the more they give you kind of a, a bonus uh, amount of interest proportionate to the increase in the cost of living. Um, then, But then there are so many of these alternatives, uh, you know, gold and uh, commodities, uh, real estate, usually as REITs or REIT ETFs. Uh, some people, I guess, with the Biden uh, stimulus are, are looking for infrastructure uh, uh, plays that play on, you know, sort of like new cork and the steel stocks and all, all that kind of thing um i think for the most part for the, the article that was at money sense uh incidentally i'm the investing editor at large these days at money sense in addition to the uh, the hub um i think for the most part people have to stay the course if, if you're in uh, a retiree uh, a lot of people think you know we're going to be living a long time never mind COVID, and uh the classic uh, asset allocation ETFs, you know, with usually 60-40 or maybe a little more 70-30 stocks should do the trick. You should hold hold it. Um, so you get into this core and explore. I think that's a slide that's coming up. Uh, I think all of the uh, the core ETFs, uh, which are basically the one this year's an asset allocation ETFs considered to be core. Um, I think the beauty of that, and I think Dan Bordelotti wrote a good book at PWL called Reboot Your Portfolio, and he's quite enthusiastic about keeping to the core and not getting too crazy on all these crypto funds and theme funds and meme stocks. Um, and he thinks the real benefit of these asset allocation ETFs is the automatic rebalancing. 
Uh, you don't have, so if you're at a 60, 40 mix and the stocks go crazy and it goes up to 70, you don't have to worry about selling off the 10% to get back to your original um, position. Um, there are, I, I, one thing I, I've looked at things like the uh, Ray Dalio, for example, has his all weather portfolio or Harry Brown's another version of it, sort of the, you know, these portfolios that supposedly will work no matter whether it's inflation, deflation, uh, prosperity, or sort of stagnation. Um, what I found, I was surprised Dalio actually has more than half in fixed income, only 30% in stocks, uh, even the, and then the fixed income portion, a lot of that is tips and the, the inflation index um, ETFs that we discussed. But he also has 10, 15 percent in in, uh, in in commodities, basically half in gold, gold ETFs, and the other half, 7.5 percent, in um, commodities ETFs. Now there are a few in the states. If you look in the Canada, you're not going to find a lot of uh, in, of uh, you'll you'll find materials, you know, Vanguard and BMO have materials ETFs, for example, and of course. Canada basically the TSX is pretty strong on materials and energy, so you're you're covered to some extent because Canada is uh, a commodity sort of country. Um, but the one thing that uh, Dale Dale Roberts, because I edited his stuff a lot at, at, at Money Sense, uh, he he likes a product which I he did convince me to buy personally, which is the Purpose uh, Real Assets Fund, uh, PRA is the ticker. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see more, I'd like to see more uh, of that kind of product uh, coming in 2022 from BMO and uh, its competitors. Thanks, John. And I expect that to be a trend in 2022 when we talk about new product launches at the end of next year to see more of these inflation hedge ideas come to market. Uh, I will highlight though on the screen, maybe just talk you through this graph that I, I thought was a strong visual I wanted to include just to show you uh, the power of using an inflation hedging product, especially in the fixed income market where Mark mentioned in fixed income uh, that's much more exposed to rising inflation than the equity side or the equity portion of your portfolio. So the blue line here uh, is showing an investment of $1,000 just at the beginning of 2020 in uh, a US tips short term uh, bond index or you can get get the etf that tracks that index and uh it's actually has a positive return looking into uh this november versus the aggregate canadian aggregate bond index and the canadian short-term bond index if you remember that bond slide i showed earlier with all the negative returns the us tips and the inflation hedge actually has positive returns so something to think about uh, when you're inflation hedging that fixed income portion of your portfolio Okay, well, we can't talk about 2021 without talking about crypto assets. We kind of touched on it at the beginning. Um, Mark, I'm gonna bring you back into the conversation. What are your thoughts around all these Bitcoin, Ethereum ETFs in the market? We're seeing tons of flows. What are your thoughts here? Sure, well, in, in this space, of course, uh, new for ETFs, uh, there's some longer term, of course, price history out there, but. The first thing I would I would certainly note is you know the long term growth tra trajectory is what gets everybody excited right uh, so you you see that opportunity of, with the further digitization uh, and the transformation of of how we interact uh, on on the web and there's a huge opportunity there that I think a lot of people just intuitively understand uh, the other side of the coin is how does it fit in your portfolio. Uh, certainly, it's going to be a big piece of your your speculation bucket, if you will. Uh, so, if you're doing any kind of core satellite things of that nature, you may be doing something there because um, you see a lot of volatility, right? Just the chart on the screen. Uh, I know when when the first ETF came out, uh, it almost almost immediately lost about 30% of its value, uh, which is a tough spill to pill to take right out of the gates. Uh, but has re rebounded really strongly, uh, putting that that drop behind it. Uh, so again, you have to be able to weather some volatility. Uh, I think it ties into the question of how much risk you want in your portfolio, because you know you're not really tying yourself to something with, you know, a, a plant and a in an industry and in company earnings. So it's really hard to predict uh, where valuation is going to go. Uh, but certainly as a risk on speculation satellite, I think a lot of uh, a lot of investors have, have 
clearly showing interest. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When we look at those flows, investors are are keen to get in on the crypto game. But John, as you wrote in this article, and I think this is a fabulous point. Um, you know, are investors using these ETFs as a satellite, or are they thinking? Are there are they way overweight in these ETFs and then taking on a lot of risk? What are your thoughts on on how investors are using these ETFs? Well, certainly, I think if it's not a core fund, then it's it, it's an explorer fund. So any theme in, in crypto would be one of them. Would be, I mean, to me, the, the discussion of how much crypto should you have in a portfolio. I mean, I originally wrote, you know, one or two percent, but be, be quick to take profits. That one percent could quickly become three or four percent. It did when I experimented with it even a, a couple of years ago. Uh, so you have to be really quick to, you know, basically sell half on a double, uh, which you wouldn't do with a, you know, a broadly diversified dividend ETF, for example. Uh, I've seen a lot of people talk about. Um, I mean, it used to be people said gold should be 10 percent of your portfolio as an inflation hedge but what we've seen in the last couple of months is gold hasn't really jumped at all with all this inflation hype uh it now younger people seem to think that basically crypto is digital gold and so i'm even seeing people like jim kramer uh who used to be a 10 percent gold guy now he's saying uh sell half your gold take it down to five percent and put the five percent into crypto um so that's basically what i would do as well and you know you can throw in commodity etfs if you can find any in, in there as well but all of these are small positions i mean the only big core position i'd have 60 or 70 percent of my money in would be an asset allocation etf or possibly an s&p 500 index fund yeah i love your point on investors need to keep a steady eye on something like a crypto etf because of the type of volatility if it does run hot um, like it, like it can. You're you're going to be way overweight, and it's important to look at that rebalancing more often in asset classes like this that bump around a lot. Um, one of the last kind of trends that we've saw in 2021 that I'd like to touch on is ESG or environmental, social, and governance focused ETFs. In Canada this year, um, they've surpassed a billion in assets. That's a pretty large milestone. Mark, what are your thoughts around uh, ESG and how investors are, are playing this angle? Sure, thanks, Danielle. And certainly we are seeing the rise of ESG ETFs. Uh, as we mentioned off the top, a number of new products coming out, but just as importantly, investors are, are certainly starting to transition some of their portfolio assets into them as, as we are seeing the assets rise. I think what's interesting is, you know, if I compare it to early days of ETFs, uh, you kind of get a core exposure to start. So something like the ESG leaders indexes that, that we offer regionally and globally. Um, but now as the market continues to grow, you are seeing different slices come out. So whether that's environment focused or climate focused, uh, whether that's low carbon, uh, whether it's certain uh, social or, or diversity themed ETFs, I think you're starting to see a real growth, uh, not just in broad ESG, but thematic ESG. And that's just good news for investors because it's allowing them to, again, align their portfolios uh, with where their, where their values are at. So overall, early days, uh, but certainly have a have a look if you haven't already, because there's a lot of good product that's come to market. Thanks, Mark. So just to kind of summarize before we hit hit up our our questions, there's 40 providers now in the Canadian ETF market as of uh, as of today, or the end of 2021, over a thousand tickers. Even like Mark mentioned, even in the ESG space, there are you know probably a hundred tickers to, to choose from. So as always, we encourage everybody today to just do your research, see what's out there. Uh, I'm sure with this many tickers, there is something that is, is right for your portfolio that you can use as a building block. We got some great questions. We want to hit them all since we are, uh, this is our last session of the year. So the first question coming from a uh, listener or a viewer, what are year end distributions and what should I be aware of if I buy ETFs around this time of year? Mark, I know this is, you're very busy with year end distributions right now. Um, can you just kind of talk us through this question? Sure, thanks, Danielle. Uh, so just like a mutual fund or a lot of other investment vehicles, 
at the end of the year, the ETF has to pass out uh, any of its income and capital gains to its unit holders if it hasn't already done so over the course of the year with distributions. Uh, so certainly something to be aware of, uh, particularly on the capital gains front, uh, that there might be a, a uh, distribution at the end of the year. And, you know, and I think that markets have been up for almost two years running now. Certainly the odds of that happening are, are higher across the industry. Uh, so I would encourage anyone who's, who's thinking about buying into something, you know, here at the end of the year, uh, look at the provider websites. They do provide the uh, estimated distributions uh, or even, even more easy to handle. Uh, just wait to January to enter into those new positions and then you won't get surprised by those year-end distributions. Um, and I know I mentioned capital gains, but there can be other things as well. You know, we've talked about inflation-protected bonds. Uh, there could be a sizable inflation adjustment that comes through at year-end. So you just don't want to buy into something right before it distributes and, and catch the whole year's worth of distributions. So a little caution, a little research there. And the easiest way to go about it is to wait for January. Thanks. Great, great advice. Thanks for talking us through that, Mark. I'm going to stick with you because uh, we have a question about ZWB. You must cover call banks ETF. This uh, person in particular is wondering when that dividend hike is going to be passed through uh, to the ETF. Sure. So, of course, we are seeing the underlying banks now raise their dividends. That's been big news in the marketplace. Uh, so, ZEB. Our, our Canadian Equal Weight Bank ETF, you know, you can expect that distribution to rise commensurately. A uh, little bit less of a straight line to ZWB, which is the covered call Canadian banks, just because it's got that overlay of the, the call premiums received. Um, so that does vary over time. But you can expect that in the new year, uh, the distribution on both ZEB and ZWB uh, should uh, rise just because the underlying dividend stream from the banks, uh, of course, is increasing. Thanks, Mark. With inflation at a high, how will this impact REITs over the next three to five years? And does BMO offer a real estate focused ETF? John, what are your thoughts on, on REITs and inflation? Yeah, I think it's a good asset class, again, in that category of crypto and gold and commodities. I've even seen uh, utilities uh, mentioned in the same context. Uh, BMO does have a, a, a an equal weight REITs index fund, ZRE, I know, because I can I see it in my own portfolio. And it's basically, as you'd expect, uh, it's a good mix of uh, you know retail REITs, residential, uh, industrial, uh, office REITs, healthcare, uh, et cetera. So, um, but it, instead of having like, if you have a market weight ETF, uh, REIT ETF, it's going to be hugely into uh, Rio Can or something like that. The good thing about equal weight is everything's around five or six percent, and uh, I think you get a, a, probably a better play on that. So uh, yeah, I think it's a good asset class. Depends on uh, that's this is Canadian, of course. Some people may want to have some U.S. REIT exposure as well, and Vanguard and other companies certainly will provide those in, in the form of ETFs. Thanks so much, John, for tackling that question for us. Uh, with inflation fears and continuous recession talk, is there a BMO ETF that benefits from a market downturn? Mark, what are your thoughts here? Sure. Well, first off, I'd, I'd say we don't have inverse ETFs. There are some out there, but if people are looking at those, uh, certainly caution you, as I'm sure those providers would, around market volatility and you know, really investing for the short term with those products. Uh, but in long products, so products that hold and are exposed to market, you know, when we talk about uh, these two things, there's really two separate things here, inflation fears and recession talk. Uh, so if I had to combine them together, you probably want something that's more uh, upfront cash flows, mature companies, uh, and hopefully uh, with some competitive advantages that can help them withstand a downturn. So to me, uh, that points to quality investing, uh, which looks under the hood at things like revenue from operations, limited leverage, those types of things. So I would go with ZGQ, our global quality ETF, because you're going to get that market exposure, uh, but you're going to get a little bit of protection again because it's industry leaders 
uh, companies with with market uh, market advantages versus their competition, uh, and then inflation. You know that points you towards equities as long as it's not runaway inflation. Uh, so you want to be participating. Uh, so again, ZGQ would be my choice there. Thanks. Thanks for that insight, Mark. Uh, one more for you, because I know you looked this this stat up for us. We appreciate that. Does the stock market typically typically stabilize over the holiday season and begin moving again? What are your thoughts on the seasonality and, and the way the market moves? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, look this one up uh, before before we got on the line here. Uh, December is actually the month that scores the highest uh, at over 75% positive returns, and that, that's based on the S&P going back to 1928. So I guess that's the, the, the Santa effect or the holiday cheer, if you will, uh, coming through to market. So there's a clear trend that December tends to be a good month. Uh, I'd caution listeners, one, that it tends to be a lower volume month because of course a lot of people are, are away from from work and, and from their accounts um, and as well as you know we think specific to this year of course we're worried about two things one is COVID with the Omicron uh, variant coming through and of course inflation that we've talked about a fair bit on this call so other things to think about uh, but December does tend to be if you look long term uh, a very consistently positive month Great insight there. Thanks for looking into that for us. This was a great session. I want to thank everyone for joining us, not just today, but all year. We are going to take a break. We will be back Friday, January 7th. We have a great topic, US dollar ETF. So be sure to tune in for our first, our first one of 2022. And as a reminder, this session is provided for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance we'll see in 2022.